toxic aortic aneurysm. So what do you think happened to that patient? Yep. Chest pain wasn't from a heart attack. He did have EKG changes. The chest pain was from a dissecting aneurysm. So it just goes to show you, there's some things you can do in the field. There's a lot you can't because there's other things that are going on that you don't know. Um, okay, we talked about that. Glucagon, you can do it IV or IM. You've, you've got to feed the patient. Uh, I've had two cases I've seen uh, in QA review. Uh, they were from EMS that dealt with two uh, hypoglycemic patients with mental status changes that they bought a Snickers bar for and stuck it in their mouth and was d were chewing for the patient like this. I don't ever want to see that on a run sheet. Well, it wasn't the fire people that did it. The fire people showed up and the EMS was already there and they looked and they were doing this and they said, what are you doing? And they told them and, and they said, don't you think you should put a line in and just give them some glucose? What if they aspirate or choke on those nuts that are in that Snickers bar? <laughs> Patient was confused, disoriented. They couldn't chew, they were chewing for him. So, I mean, use some common sense, you know, really? Hyperglycemia and diabetic ketoacidosis. Now, you won't be able to tell this per se because you don't do uh, lactic acids or serum acetones. However, you're probably in the next year or so, there will be a new protocol for sepsis alerts, and you'll probably have a, uh, one of those ISTATs for lactic acidosis to do because they want to start treatment in the field. I don't know how they're going to give you antibiotics to give these people because of the antibiotics they use for them are expensive and many of them you can't store in an ambulance. But in any event, this is their next latest and greatest thing that they want to do. So let's talk about uh, some of the pathophysiology of DKA. Uh, one question you always want to ask a diabetic when you get a sugar that's high is have they ever been acidotic? Have they ever had DKA? You want to know that. That's important to know. I ask them that when I see them. Treatment's a little different. Okay, for your role in this, uh, most of the time it's going to be fluids. You're not going to worry about giving them insulin. They need fluid, whether they're DKA or hyperosmolar. Yeah, just as high, I know. Uh, the ones in the ER do the same thing. You have to send off a lab sample. Uh, ours go to 500, I think, and, and that's fine, uh, but what I'm saying to you is that you don't really need to worry about the insulin. These people are usually dry, whether they're DKA or hyperosmolar. They almost always require a minimum of two liters of fluid, so give them fluid. Uh, generally true, DKA patients are not usually comatose. I've seen sugars of 2,500, and the patient was awake and talking to me. Um, so that is true. They many times will tell you they've been peeing a lot and very thirsty. Maybe they've been eating a lot. You know, about 20% of the population can't smell fruity odors on the breath. I can't smell it. What I smell is musty odor, like somebody in liver disease. I'll smell that with a diabetic who's DKA, but I can't smell a fruity odor. Abdominal pain is very common because of the fluid shifts. They'll get a lot of belly pain and it'll be mistaken for uh, an acute abdomen. I've seen them come in the ER with rigid abdomens that look like they had peritonitis. And when we did their labs, we saw that their sugar was out of control. Gave them a lot of fluid. Uh, would start them on some insulin once we got a couple liters in them. Most of these patients required six or seven liters of fluid. That's how dry many of them were. Some of them have infections, some don't. The belly pain almost always ended up being a non-issue. <coughs> Within 12 hours, their pain would be gone and they didn't have a surgical abdomen, so you can get fooled. That's why it's important to stay with your ABCs. And here's the first statement here is why I tell you you don't need to give insulin. They can do it at the hospital unless you're on a protracted transport. You want to watch for arrhythmias. 
hyperkalemia, hypocalcemia, all those types of things. You may see those EKG changes. Normally, those you see with patients who have some renal disease and who have uh, uh, elevated creatinines and potassiums over 6.5. You'll see those changes on the EKG. It doesn't usually occur for the most part in most of our patients. Hyperosmolar non-ketotic coma, frequently an older patient. They're not acidotic. They are dry. That's where the hyperosmolarity comes in. And of course, their sugars are high. They no don't normally get acidotic. They usually are diabetics. And they may present as uh, lethargic. They may be obtunded. DKAs are almost not, almost always not obtunded, and you can have seizures. You need fluids. You might need to give uh, D50 if the sugar is really low, because that can happen. So you need to check their glucose. Pancreatitis, let's talk about this briefly because this is a uh, uh, complication of diabetes. Can be a medical emergency. Usually it's a chronic condition and it's recurrent. Uh, I had a patient the other day who came in with belly pain over here and in his back. He said he had back pain for three days, went to another facility. They did a uh, CT of his uh, kidney and told him uh, he had a kidney stone. I said, you have a history of stones? He said, no, I have a history of pancreatitis. I said, what was your amylase and lipase? They didn't do it, they said I had a kidney stone. He looked like pancreatitis to me. So I treated him, his amylase was 2400, lipase was 3000 or something. Uh, he was dry, scanned him again. His pancreas was swollen, his uh, Kidneys were normal. There was no evidence of stone or hydro or post-hydro or anything like that. So, but as you see, you can get flank pain with this. Frequently, pancreatitis is abdominal pain in here, radiates through into the back. That's the most common cause because of where the pancreas sits behind the stomach. So that's usually how they'll present. Nausea and vomiting. They may get some bloating. Remember I mentioned something called the phlegmom. That's a big pancreatic cyst. So their belly may be distended from a phlegmom. Your job is basically supportive, pain medicine, fluids, a nausea medicine, because they'll frequently be vomiting. Uh, that's something that you need to do. We don't need this, don't need this, don't need this, don't need this, don't need this. Don't need that, don't need that. Um, I don't know if you'll see this. Normally, this is not something I'm going to call you for. Now, th these types of patients uh, come into the ER, they come in by car. I've not seen anybody with Cushing syndrome arrive, unless they're a nursing home patient. And if you look at the signs and symptoms, see how general they are. They can be almost anything. So you won't do anything other than your ABCs, unless you want to give them a little bit of sugar. But it's basically management of the ABCs. You're not going to do that, not going to do that, not going to do that. Hypothyroid, again, you're not going to make that diagnosis. Um, if they carry a diagnosis of hypothyroidism, they'll already be on treatment. How you know, compliant they are is usually not an issue. Most diabetics or, I mean, uh, thyroid patients do take their medicine because they feel so crappy when they don't. Graves' disease is hyperthyroidism. You get a swollen neck, too much thyroxin, and uh, you can get tachycardia with it. They can be sweating. They can have bulging eyes. Again, they know they have the disease. They're not going to call you. They'll come in on their own accord. Hashimoto's thyroiditis, very common. I see it in the office. Uh, it's associated with uh, celiac disease, which is a, a GI issue. And uh, sometimes you can see it with the uh, TPO um, uh, numbers on the thyroid panel. They'll be very high, so that's an autoimmune disorder, hard to treat. Sometimes we give them thyroid medicine. Sometimes we give them uh, 
um, steroids, but there's no standard for that. When you just have TPO antibodies that are elevated, it just means they have an autoimmune condition going on. Myxedema coma, again, I haven't seen one of these in years. I think it's more common in the colder states. Usually obese, they have a, uh, problems regulating body temperature because of their thyroid disease, so they have fatigue, dry skin, which are findings for thyroid disease. Also can see a Queen Anne sign. If you look at people and they're missing the lateral half of their eyebrow, that's called Queen Anne sign. It means they're hypothyroid. And yes, these people, the people do get uh, some obtundation. All you're going to do is the ABCs. If they're hypoxic, you're going to treat it. You may have to tube them. It may be hypothermic. You're not going to need sedatives or narcotics, so uh, don't think you'll see that either. Thyroid storm, maybe. Again, these patients know they have a thyroid problem, they'll tell you, but they're, no, they're not going to call you for this usually. They come into the ER, they walk in, that's how I see them. But you can have fever, uh, tachycardia, and vomiting, but you're going to, when you see that, you're just going to assume it's an infection and you're going to treat it with fluids and, uh, you know, maybe a, a monitor kind of thing. Diabetes insipidus, they can't regulate fluid balance, central diabetes insipidus, lack of ADH. They have two different types, is the central and the nephrogenic, you won't see this. Uh, again, they would come in telling you that that's what they had. All right, let's take a break and then our presentations, I'm done.